Well, the Wall Street Journal out with a bombshell new story about Jeffrey Epstein, and the timing of this story is interesting. It reveals his calendars in the years after he had already gone to prison. And who was he meeting with in these calendar meetings? Well, why was he meeting with the now head of the CIA and uh, meeting to talk about hiring lawyers for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? All sorts of very interesting questions that have emerged from this report. And there's no one that I would rather speak to about this than investigative journalist Whitney Webb, who's written two books on Jeffrey Epstein and the ties to the deep state with all of this. Whitney, welcome back to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me back. My pleasure. So these calendars are just at a high level before we kind of get into some of the details here. The, these private calendars are released now. I'm always curious when I see a, like this big front page mainstream media news yeah. article. Why? How do? Why now? How does the Wall Street Journal get their hands on these calendars? And why are we hearing about this now? <clears throat> That's a really good thing to bring up because we actually, if you read the Wall Street Journal article itself, they don't say who they obtain these documents from or how. And what's amazing about it is they say this is thousands and thousands of pages, not just of the calendar meetings, but uh, emails and other correspondences, which they have not made public. And it's unclear if this was given to any other sort of organization or just the Wall Street Journal. And if there were any sort of rules imposed on their use of these documents, like they could only talk about the calendar, for example. I mean, we don't really know and we don't have a lot of transparency uh, into that. But it certainly is true that some of the things that had been revealed by the Wall Street Journal, which, again, didn't make any of these documents, including the ones they cite in the article uh, public, there are some revelations there about some very prominent people uh, that give some insight into the fact that a lot of these elite circles, particularly in the financial world, were completely unfazed uh, by Epstein's sex trafficking um, scandals and arrests. And I mean, we know that now, uh, like we talked about previously, because of what's come out uh, as part of the J.P. Morgan Chase Epstein lawsuit um, that executives knew and, and openly joked about. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein's relatively well known, at least among their circle, his his sexual proclivities, right? right. And uh, as you can see in in this uh, in this reporting, it's quite clear that top officials um, in the financial world were also similarly unfazed. And what's interesting too is that you know, uh, yes, there's mention of of current CIA director William Burns and uh, Catherine uh, Rumler, who's the lead counsel of Goldman Sachs. But at the time they began meeting with Epstein, they were working in the Obama administration. And it seems like, at least in the case of uh, uh, Catherine Rumler's case, uh, that he helped essentially connect her with her current job um, as being lead counsel for Goldman Sachs, which is pretty significant because I believe um, there she's also involved in their risk policy committee. Hmm. Which means, you know, uh, the same sort of policies uh, to prevent Goldman Sachs for, for example, committing financial crimes or, uh, you know, detecting uh, people in their organization engaging in illegal activity. The, the people that are part of that risk policy committee would be responsible for doing. And one of the um why she was being courted by Epstein, she was a top lawyer at this particular, particularly prominent law firm, uh, and she was specializing in the defense of people accused of white collar crime. So again, this takes me back to a lot of what I refer to in my book about how a lot of the focus on Jeffrey Epstein has been almost exclusively in the mainstream media on him as a sex trafficker, but he's an extensive, uh, it was extensively involved in white collar financial crime. Uh, money laundering on behalf of intelligence agencies and all, and all sorts of weird activity in the financial world. And, uh, you know, this is, again, confirmation that that's definitely the case. So a lot of these people who have been named um, as, as having these meetings, you know, have claimed, oh, it's because Epstein was wealthy and he had all of these connections, right? And that's how they justify having visited him. But really, no, these people were visiting him because he was a well-seasoned, very successful and well-known financial criminal involved in things like um, uh, tax evasion, money laundering, and all sorts of these activities. That's why you'd be going to someone like Jeffrey Epstein. Not because, oh, yeah. look at his wealth, because as we know now, his wealth was largely a facade. And this was likely known at the time as reflected by a lot of what's come out with the J.P. Morgan lawsuit and that he didn't even have financial activity at J.P. Morgan at consistent with a client-based business. So he didn't really have clients, right? right. He was... Uh, not actually allegedly wealthy. I mean, he, there's obvious weird stuff he was engaged in here, 
And at uh, the time of these meetings overlaps with his involvement with a company he was running in the Virgin Islands called Southern Trust, which as noted in the Wall Street Journal article, um, negotiated contracts with some of the people named in these calendar meetings like Ariane de Rothschild uh, to you know, provide uh, risk analysis, uh, software and algorithms and if you read the depositions, which we can talk about in a second, about what Epstein exactly was doing at Southern Trust, uh, that's very crazy because a lot of what he was doing there is uh, seems to have been involved in uh, basically using some sort of primitive AI to engage in the same kind of uh, shady financial activity that he was known for previously. So when you look at these people that are on these calendar meetings and you see these bankers and you see the people associated on the financial side, it seems like from what we're hearing is that they were able to, to sort of look past his sexual proclivities. It's the, all of these meetings sort of take they take place years after he was in prison for sex trafficking. And yeah. we heard from the, the, C, the people around CIA director William Burns that, that they now, they're now saying he didn't know anything about his past which I find hilarious. You mean the head of the CIA oh. doesn't know anything about Jeffrey Epstein's past and he continued to have meetings with this person? Well, so at the time uh, Burns was meeting with Epstein, he was deputy secretary of state in 2014, which is the Obama administration. And Epstein has a very weird connection with the state department going back to the early nineties, like when he was, um, renting out and had arrangement real estate arrangements with a property owned or uh, by the state department that makes no sense and ties to a uh, secretary of state uh, under um, one of them under george bush senior and you know other weird connections uh, throughout the years with the state department so to see william burns meeting with him allegedly about burns planned transition into the private sector you know, is definitely bizarre and then um another thing too is that Burns uh, is described in the Wall Street Journal article as a career diplomat, but he was also ambassador to Russia. And Epstein has a lot of ties to these networks that were involved in the so-called rape of Russia after the, co the collapse of the Soviet Union, including this Harvard network responsible for a lot of those policies, like Larry Summers, for example. Um, out of Harvard and was actually very involved with the sort of activity that Microsoft under Bill Gates in the late 90s uh, was doing in Russia. He actually joined the official Microsoft Russia trip for reasons that are still unknown in the company of chief technology officer of Microsoft at the time, Nathan Mervold. Um, and what was he doing there? And then of course we have these references in the Wall Street Journal article at the same time he was meeting with Burns, he was essentially fronting in some capacity for Bill Gates and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, introducing um, one of these uh, top uh, councils, White House councils in the Obama administration at the same time he's meeting with Burns, uh, you know, to people in these in these same circles. It's it's definitely very odd, you know, hard to know exactly uh, what's going on. But again, you know, uh, the same denials are in this Wall Street Journal article like Bill Gates had no connection and I had no connection and, you know, they're trying to downplay it. But ultimately, I think, you know, the fact that these names were not in the flight logs were not in the black book. There are so many other people that were deeply connected to Epstein that we still don't know about. And, you know, it's slowly trickling out, I guess. Yeah, we're hearing, you know, of course, Noam Chomsky and 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 others, of course, uh, yeah. also in this uh, this this Wall Street Journal piece, and that is, of course, a, a really odd question. Why was Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky saying, you know, one thing publicly, meeting with Jeffrey Epstein on the side, and then, of course, also meeting with Ehud Barak? Um, yeah, and, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of mysterious questions, and when asked and sort of confronted about it, you know, why were you meeting with Jeffrey Epstein? And said, none of your business, none of your business. Yeah. Yeah, a very strong negative response from Chomsky when challenged on this, especially considering that when the Epstein scandal around 2019 was really breaking, Chomsky uh, would say things about, you know, the Epstein MIT connection, saying things like, oh, well, there's people way worse than Epstein that donate to MIT. Uh, but in, in the context of making those statements, Chomsky said nothing about having met with Epstein um, and, you know, with people like Woody Allen who are right. controversial in a way quite similar to Epstein, right? And then also Ehud Barak, a former uh, head of military intelligence and prime minister of Israel, um, you know, uh, who, who was also, by the way, very central to the sex trafficking activities of Epstein, uh, having sleepovers at the apartments where trafficked women uh, were housed that was owned by um, OSA properties run by Jeffrey Epstein's brother, Mark Epstein. So 
you know, that that's pretty insane. Uh, and yeah. it, I think pretty clearly exposes Noam Chomsky for the big hypocrite that he is. So, um, yeah. don't really know what else to say about it, except that I think, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal article didn't really dig deep into the Epstein MIT ties, but they are pretty significant. Um, especially so part of it was again back to this long standing tie to Microsoft as a corporation. Going back to the 90s, he was first connected with MIT Media Lab by a former, um, I think, senior vice president at Microsoft named Linda Stone, who at the time was employing a former member of Epstein's underage entourage as her secretary. And um, uh, he was uh, directing Bill Gates to donate there and, uh, you know, sort of managing a lot of big time donations for this particular part of MIT, which uh, eventually led to the resignation of the head of the MIT Media Lab. Uh, but he also had very close ties to another very prominent MIT figure besides Noam Chomsky, Marvin Minsky, uh, a pioneer of AI research. And Minsky and Chomsky were were close, so it's very possible that um, Minsky was introduced or introduced Chomsky to Epstein. But it could have come through other means because Minsky isn't wasn't involved in any of these meetings. Though I think he died around this time, to be honest. But uh, you know the meetings with Ehud Barak and all of that. I don't know. Uh, it, it's hard to know because Chomsky won't say very much about it and claims that he was uh, discussing political and academic topics and they were talking about. Um, and his wife Israeli was policy. there and yeah, it's really yeah. policy, mm -hmm. et cetera. I mean, whenever I see a story like this too, I'm always curious, we're heading into an election year. Of, who are they trying to discredit by now releasing this information? I'm always very curious about that. Was there, was there anything like that that stood out to you in this piece when that you didn't know or that you were that you were sort of shocked by in this piece? So, you know, it's hard to know exactly what the reason is, at least at this point, for this particular information coming out. And again, remember, this is thousands of pages of documents. These are the names that the Wall Street Journal from those documents decided to release without the documents themselves being public. So it's very possible that there are other prominent names there that they chose to with, uh, withhold for whatever reason. Um, but, uh, you know, my theory about why Epstein was arrested in 2019, I don't really think it had much to do with people in, you know, the very corrupt SDNY district in New York City wanting to take Epstein down finally for sex crimes, uh, considering their history and some of the lawyers and and, and different people involved in that case. Um, I think it has more to do with with factions uh, in sort of these elite intelligence linked organized crime linked circles. And I sort of see them as battling with each other, not necessarily because one's good and one's bad, but more sort of like as predators are, you know, uh, fighting over who gets what part of the carcass. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so I, I think it's really hard uh, to know, unfortunately, but based on my research, uh, by the time Epstein was arrested in 2019, which is again, a couple years after these, uh, you know, docu these documents, I believe stop at like 2017, but around the time he was arrested, he had, he was allegedly advising people like Elon Musk at Tesla uh, was sort of not necessarily tied with Trump, but some people in the Trump network um, and very close to people like Mohammed bin Salman, who were working closely with Jared Kushner, for example. And Kushner, for example, has longtime uh, ties to Netanyahu, who's sort of in that same, you know, faction, uh, you know, with 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 um, globally speaking, you know, with right. Trump. And so and so I think, you know, it's possible that they were, you know, not happy about being, uh, so, someone was not happy about something Epstein was doing or that particular broader faction was doing and wanted to, you know, Epstein, there was a lot of dirt on him obviously out there and he was easy to turn into uh, this, this boogeyman he's become. But as I note in my book, this type of behavior that Epstein engaged in, including the sexual activity, uh, has been going on for a very long time in these very same circles. And as people like Cindy McCain, John McCain's wife, have come forward and said, everyone knew what Epstein was doing and no one did anything about it. So this isn't something that like they're actually outraged by. They just sort of have to feign uh, outrage about it. And, you know, I think, uh, again, a lot of what happened with Epstein comes down to the rise, actually, of Mohammed bin Salman, which sort of deposed the CIA's golden boy in Saudi Arabia. And John Brennan, CIA director under Obama, was very close to that particular figure that was taken out by Mohammed bin Salman, who's then much to this 
you know, other, other faction. So I, you know, I, I think there's a lot more to be discovered about, you know, what this, the exact nature of this factional war is. And I think we have to keep in mind too, that these factions evolve over time. Like none of this is, is Static. rigid and in place. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, you know, it's hard to know exactly why it's happening now, because keep in mind, you have this stuff going on with Epstein ties and the JP Morgan situation, you know, um, uh, it, again, it's really hard, you know, to know who's running what and for what purpose. Uh, right. But then you again, a, you know, the uh, on a day, literally today, Monday, uh, May first, when J.P. Morgan takes over uh, First Republic. You know, so you have J.P. Morgan now becoming even larger and more powerful than ever before, yeah. um, being yeah. called upon by the federal government to take over this bank. Uh, and so, and I, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions here about the CIA part of this still too. Um, you know, how does the CIA even allow this story to come out? You know, if they, we know the ties that yeah. the intelligence community has with the mainstream media. Right. Well, I think it's very possible that maybe there's certain, so, you know, William Burns isn't a career guy in intelligence. He was, again, a career described as a career diplomat, former ambassador to Russia, Russia, former top pick figure in the State Department. And before being CIA director, he was head of the Carnegie Endowment, which is sort of one of these quote unquote nonprofits that are very similar to the World Economic Forum, for example. So it's possible that, you know, a different faction that wants, you know, a career intelligence person in CIA director would be very happy to dunk on Burns, for example. Well, you know, yeah. that's not he he may be in charge, but that's not not necessarily the world he spent his entire career, for example. So, right. you know, uh, it, it might be a way of showing him he's not necessarily as in control as he would like to think. You know, there's a lot of weird stuff going around, too, uh, in terms of like what seems to be the normalization of things that were previously called conspiracy theory, you know, in recent months, really, uh, you know, there's been um, you had Tucker Carlson openly talking about, you know, the CIA, CIA being involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy, for example, right, um, yeah. and, you know, all sorts of things, you know, going on in those particular spheres. So, I mean, who, who knows really what's going on at this point? I think all we can really count on is that the powers that be are pushing for total control and they will manipulate whatever narrative to try and suit uh, those agendas. And there's very possible that there's factions that want to be, you know, on the top of that power structure at the end of the day. And we could, you know, I suspect that we're seeing different factions duke it out for who gets to be, you know, king of the castle of this yeah. crazy control grid that they're setting up. Well, that's why I started out by asking you, why now? Why are we hearing about this story now? Because I'm always walking into these stories trepidatious, you know, with a, with a bit of trepidation here. So, um, but no one I would rather speak to about this. Um, I would encourage all of you to read the two volume uh, great deep dive books on Jeffrey Epstein, the deep state and how the deep state mafia is controlling everything. And, and hopefully, and Whitney, we'll have you back if we do get some of these emails, we get some of these con uh, conversations, we can dive <laughs> deeper hope. into the deep <laughs> depositions and all so much as we peel this onion back. Whitney Webb, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.